and welcome to this special Access Live event. I'm Callie Moore, host of PBS Eons, and tonight I'm in the David H. Koch Hall of Fossils at the National Museum of Natural History. And tonight I'm joined by Adam Pritchard, postdoctoral fellow at the museum who studies the reptiles that lived before the mammals. And tonight he's going to be giving us a behind the scenes tour. Thanks for having us. Oh. Um, we're excited to have you here and show this off. Yeah, and I sh I'm sure people have been lined up to see this exhibit since it opened on the yeah, 8th. Out the, out the door. Okay. It's, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, it's been closed for five years and through the tireless efforts of our curators, artists, fossil preparators and technicians, everybody in the museum, you know, made this a reality in 2019. So, sure. welcome. Yes, and I bet most people are here to see the star of this exhibit, the nation's T-Rex. How, how big is this creature? This Tyrannosaurus specimen is about 15 feet tall at the hips, 40 feet long, so kind of the, the standard issue size for an adult Tyrannosaurus Rex. Now, the amount that it's in, the position, it could be taken as a scavenger or a predator, correct? It's, yeah, it's a little bit hedging because like Tyrannosaurus, carnivorous animal, and most carnivorous animals living today scavenge when the opportunity is presented, but hunt when necessary. And T-Rex was probably much like that. Right, so we know that T-Rex is one species in a family of carnivorous dinosaurs that lived about 66 to 67 million years ago. What can you tell us about this particular specimen? So this skeleton was discovered in the late 1980s and then excavated by a crew from the Museum of the Rockies. It's about 50% complete, so only about half of the bones are the originals. It's notable because it has a really well-preserved forelimb, so the tiny two-fingered arm, this is one of the best examples of that. A lot of the work was done to put this, a lot of work was done to put this mount together mm. to, to fill in the missing bones. One of the most notable examples is the skull on this mounted skeleton is actually a cast, uh -huh. and the original skull is just too darn heavy to actually make mounting it on this on this display feasible. Now I heard that the Smithsonian did a full 3D scan of this skeleton. Yeah, digitization, like three-dimensional digitizing of fossil specimens is a big thing. The Smithsonian is very much dedicated to that. Over 200 bones from this T-Rex were digitally scanned and actually you can see the three-dimensional model of this display on any web browser on our website. Wow, and so can you print that out too if you have access to a 3D printer? Absolutely. Oh, that's cool. That's what I'm gonna do when I get home. I'm gonna print out one of these yeah. skeletons. Oh, that's amazing. So a lot of people wonder about the skin covering of T-Rex, whether or not it had feathers or scales or both or what's going on with this guy? That is a really good question and it's one that scientists are still kind of delving into because right now there isn't one great specimen yeah. of Tyrannosaurus mm -hmm. rex that has the skeleton with the associated coverings still preserved. There are some specimens from West North America that have sort of patches of scaly skin in the chest and the belly regions. But we can learn a lot from close relatives of Tyrannosaurus and there are specimens from the Cretaceous period of China mm -hmm. of very large Tyrannosaurus that are mostly covered in sort of a downy, feathery covering. Right. So we can be somewhat confident that an animal like Tyrannosaurus rex would have some feathers. Right. Now, feathers you know, are an interesting thing. The feathers that were on these early Tyrannosaurs would not have been you know, similar to the flight feathers in modern right, birds. Right. They're more hair-like hmm. and could well have functioned as, as insulation for these animals. Tyrannosaurus rex, when it starts out, we don't know exactly how big the hatchlings were, but they were, you know, smaller than a turkey. So the, for an animal of that scale, insulation probably would have been a pretty useful thing. Now as they grew older, the potential use, the function of that might have been you know, less advantageous. Right, so it's possible right. that Tyrannosaurs started out as, you know, fuzzy babies <laughs> and then transitioned into somewhat scalier giant adults. Oh, that's pretty cool. Now, how old was this T-Rex? And if we know the age, how was that determined? That's a really cool thing, because we do have a pretty good sense of how old this animal was when it died. The estimate is about 20, 
roughly 20 years mm -hmm. of age. And that is determined through skeletochronology, actually looking at the skeleton and finding hallmarks of the age of the animal. If you slice open the long bones, the, the limb bones of a dinosaur, there's actually quite a bit of information in there. There's a record of the annual growth pattern. So every year, a new ring is sort of laid right, down right. within the bones of these animals. And using that information, scientists were able to make a rough determination of how old this animal was. So it was about 20, you said. Mm -hmm. And we have to cut the bones apart to see it's that? It's weird to think about. And museums have, you know, you know, have somewhat struggled to, to adapt to that new I thing. Bet. But there is so much information we can get out of doing this kind of sectioning of limb bones to learn about the actual lives of an individual dinosaur. All right, well, I think we're ready for our first audience questions for you, Adam. Are you ready? I guess we're gonna find out. All right, well, I've got my handy dandy phone here. All right, Jonathan at PBS Digital Studios Facebook wants to know, do we know why T-Rex had such small arms? It's a great question and the answer is no. <laughs> uh, T-Rex's arms are obviously quite reduced relative to the size of, mm -hmm. of other carnivorous dinosaurs, but scientists have done a lot of work looking at the muscles, the muscle attachment sites that are preserved on the bones. And there's a, still a lot of really powerful musculature attached to those tiny limb bones. So they certainly could, would have had some kind of a function that was either advantageous to the animal's life. What that is, still a mystery. So if anyone wants to try and figure that out, be my guest. There you go, kids. That's what you can study when you yeah. grow up. Why did T-Rex have such tiny arms? All right, our next question. Alora from Eon's Facebook page would like to know, why did the Jurassic have so many strange creatures? Oh boy. The funny thing is, it's, it's you know, what is strange? Now I'm getting all, now I'm getting all weight, like philosophical and stuff. But you know, the adaptations the animals in the Jurassic had, like you know, giant carnivorous bipeds or stegosaurs with plates all down their backs, might have been or strange to our eyes because no other animals today, no other large animals have anything remotely resembling that. But during the Jurassic period, whatever the, the kind of forces in the environments and from other animals around them were, pushed kind of the... Uh, the adaptation of these these straight these things that to our eyes seem very strange, but right. during the Jurassic period, you know, was these were this was the way to do it. This was the kind of what the environment required of of these animals. It was just a normal Tuesday in the Jurassic, huh? All right. So, a username Dinos Go Roar at YouTube would like mm. to know how many genuses of Triceratops are there? So, Triceratops is actually the genus name mm -hmm. of this particular horned dinosaur. There's only one genus, Triceratops, but Triceratops belongs to a larger family of other big four-footed, frilled, horned dinosaurs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. called the Ceratopsids. Right. And there's a lot. Yes, there <laughs> and are And then the number lot. keeps going up every year, which is why I can't think of what it is off the top of my head. It's well over 20 oh, at wow. this point. And the scientists are actually debating sometimes mm -hmm. whether some new genera of, of ceratopsids that are named are, are actually the same as other right. ones, mm -hmm. just because not everyone agrees. Right. But there are a ton of horned dinosaurs in the ceratopsid family, lots of genera. All right, let's see. Jacob at National Museum of Natural History Facebook, do you have a Velociraptor or Gigantopithecus on display? We do not have either a Velociraptor or a Gigantopithecus. Oh. If you really want to see a good Velociraptor, I recommend visiting either the American Museum of Natural History in New York or the Institute of Geology and Paleontology in Mongolia. Because those, that's, Mongolia is where you, yes. where you go in the world if you really want a Velociraptor. In terms of Gigantopithecus, it's a fossil ape that is only really known from teeth and jaws, mm -hmm. which is somewhat disappointing because yeah. it's seemingly very, very so large fossil yeah. ape. But for a specimen of that, I think you would have to go take a look in the museum in Beijing, China. Oh, wow, wow. All right, let's see here. 
Garolyn from Smithsonian Channel Facebook, how fast was T-Rex? Ooh, it's an interesting question and it's one that scientists are, are very interested in answering because it has implications for understanding how this animal interacted with you know, its contemporaries and its environment. It'd be really helpful for the small fleet-footed dinosaurs if T-Rex wasn't all that fast. <laughs> and a lot of studies have been done looking at the speed of modern animals and the possible kind of arrangement of the leg muscles of something mm. like Tyrannosaurus rex and how massive they would have to be for the animal to reach certain speeds. And the current estimates are something between 10 and 20 miles an hour. Right. So not nearly as fast as a speeding Jeep in the jungle of you know Jurassic Park, right. but still, you know, I'm. I'm going to get run down by that thing. Yeah, it would be very hard for me to outrun T-Rex just as not well. that fast. All right. Well, thanks for all those questions. Keep them coming. We're going to do more Q&As throughout the live stream. So T-Rex probably had feathers, but I don't think most people know that it's more closely related to birds than it is to dinosaur birds than it is to um, lizards, as its name implies. That's one of the crazy things about, you know, carnivorous dinosaurs like, like Tyrannosaurus, and indeed all dinosaurs, mm -hmm. is that their closest relatives among modern living things are the birds. In fact, the larger group of dinosaurs, the theropods, the carnivorous, the mostly carnivorous two-legged dinosaurs like T-Rex, birds are actually just one subgroup of that that kind of dinosaur. So birds are theropods. Wow, so that means birds are dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs. Remember that the next time you have some chicken, huh? You're eating a dinosaur. That's amazing. And we actually have a clip from when whales walk journeys in deep time that goes into the connection about T-Rex and dinosaurs and birds. Let's take a look. The theory that birds evolved from dinosaurs met intense opposition. How could something so huge and heavy evolve into something so small and light. One of the biggest objections was that no dinosaur had ever been found with a wishbone. In birds, the crucial brace for the chest that makes flight possible. If scientists could find a dinosaur with a wishbone, they would clinch the case. In the 1960s, Paleontologist John Ostrom hit pay dirt. A dinosaur fossil with a wishbone. He called it Deinonychus, terrible claw. Here we have Deinonychus anterophus, the fossil that changed everything that we know about the origin of birds and fundamentally altered our understanding of how flight evolved. Deinonychus was a ferocious predator with wing-like arms and all the bones and muscles necessary for flight, but it couldn't fly. Here's an animal with four limbs, much too short and much too heavy in the body to be able to fly, yet it has all the bells and whistles that we associate with the flight stroke. Not only that, it had feathers too. But all this had nothing to do with flight. Its feathers were for warmth, and its clawed wings were for killing. Wow, you guys, that was a great clip. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you catch the show when it premieres on June 19th at 9 p.m. Now, can you elaborate a little bit more about how T-Rex and birds specifically are related and similar? Absolutely. The anatomical commonalities between theropod dinosaurs like T-Rex and modern birds were really what drove scientists to first postulate that there was this evolutionary connection. And you can see some of those features in our Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton. There's a single united wishbone kind of spanning the chest at the front of the, uh, front of the animal's body. There are actually a lot of cavities in the vertebrae, the backbones of T. rex and various other bones 
that are very similar to the cavities in modern bird skeletons that support the, the air sac system that helps them breathe and be so be as light as they are. Yeah. And you know, for you know, for dramatic sake, there's also just the classic three-toed foot, mm -hmm. you know, that makes those classic carnivorous dinosaur and bird tracks so distinctive. Right, right. And um, I hear there is a giant bird. Yeah, well, if, if you're interested in birds, we can actually go over, go over to this part. Right on. And I can show you one of our more impressive huh. birds. Now, we're passing after the extinction of the dinosaur 66 million years ago. Right. And we're going to be taking a look at Diatrima, Ooh. which is a flightless bird mm -hmm. that lived, it's, it and its family lived between 55 and 45 or so million years ago in North America, Europe primarily. And it's an herbivore. In fact, one of the most prominent herbivores in the landscape. Interesting. Now, what would cause a bird to be flightless? Why would it lose its ability to fly? That's a tough question. And a lot of different bird lineages throughout their history have lost their ability to fly. And it seems to be linked to the environmental pressures that are around them. If they have little impetus to escape from predators or to go after a wide variety of food items, they aren't necessarily going to have those adaptations anymore. Wow. Oh my gosh. This is a really, this is a big bird. This is right a big here. bird. How this big is this It's a really big bird? bird. This diatrima, you know, stretched out, it's about six to seven feet in height. 300 plus pounds when it was when it was still alive. It's it's a bit of a monster. Yeah, no kidding. Um, what would enable a bird to grow to this size? Oh, opportunity, I think, is the best answer, and that means ecological opportunity. In the wake of the extinction of the dinosaur 66 million years ago, the environment had a lot of a lot of open space. Mm. Those plants and the ecosystem reasserted itself. There was room for the evolution of large herbivorous animals and carnivorous animals. And that happened to include this giant bird. Now, is this little cutie horse down here, is that typical of a mammal during this period about 50 million years ago? I guess it is kind of cute. Yeah, so a lot of early mammals like this, uh, this small horse here, multiple three-toed horse too, is kind of typical mm -hmm. of the sort of mammals that we would see in this environment somehow a little bit bigger than this, but this kind of herbivore is the thing that would be competing with an animal like diatrima. Now you mentioned that diatrima is a herbivore, yep. but it's got like this big head and this powerful beak. How was it determined that this was not a carnivore? That is a great question because I, I learned about diatrima from prehistoric life books when I was a kid yeah. and it was always depicted chowing down on well, these things well, like guys, as yeah. the top predator in its environment and you know for a long time that's what paleontologists thought its role in the environment was but recent restudy by paleontologists bird experts looking at the way the muscles of the head are constructed mm -hmm. and the way that the chemical isotopes within its bones mm -hmm. comparing those to modern herbivorous animals really strongly wreck you know kind of converges on the hypothesis that this is not a carnivore. It doesn't have those hallmarks. It's most likely a giant herbivore. That's pretty cool. All right, you guys, I want to know what you're thinking about at home. So let's take some more audience questions. Are you ready? I can just find out. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Jonathan at PBS Digital Studios Facebook would like to know why are animals smaller today than in the past? Well, it's not necessarily true that all animals that are alive today are smaller than those that came before us. For example, today mm -hmm. we have the largest animals that we know of to ever live, and mm -hmm. that, that's the blue whale right. and the various other baleen whales, which is bigger than any dinosaur and even than most fossil whales. But there are a lot of great examples of things that are larger in the recent past than they are today. Dire wolves are bigger than modern gray wolves. Um, there are a lot of fossil big cats that are larger than cats that are living today. And that may be linked to climatic changes. Large right. body size is usually something that's associated with, with cooler temperatures, right. at least among kind of modern, modern animals, and thus, in the recent past, 
substantially colder during the, the glacial period, it might have been more advantageous than it is now to be a relatively bigger. Right. Okay. Next question. Sharon on YouTube would like to know, did dinosaurs give birth to live offspring? That is a really cool, question. A cool question. And as far as we know, no. Hmm. Like I, I, to say absolutely not never, I would want to have eggs of every single dinosaur species, right, which we right, right. absolutely don't have. Mm -hmm. But we have eggs from long-necked sauropods, from big hadrosaurs, duck-billed dinosaurs, from carnivores like Allosaurus, mm -hmm. and Trodon. And in every single case we see, we see these animals lay eggs. We right. see eggshells. We see babies, I embryos in eggs. Mm -hmm. So right now, the answer is almost certainly no. And it's interesting that if the, there are 10,000 species of living birds around today, right. 10,000 dinosaurs still with us, and in none of those right. is there live birth, despite their incredible variety. So for some reason, in this, this grand lineage, live birth is just... It's never caught on. Yeah, it wasn't its thing. It no, wasn't its thing. Wasn't thing. All right, Judah at the Eons Facebook page, why do you find to be the weirdest creature that you've ever studied from the Jurassic period? So what's the weirdest creature that you know of? Well. From the Jurassic period. Yeah. <laughs> the, I'm gonna cheat a little bit, talk about a creature from the Triassic period, because I always love talking about these things. And the Triassic was pretty weird too. It was the weirdest. <laughs> That's an animal called a drapanosaur. These are chameleon-like animals, superficially mm -hmm. lizard-like. But instead of a chameleon head, put almost like a bird face with giant, yes. giant binocular vision eyes facing forward, a huge sort of inflated head, a beak out front, huge, powerful clawed arms where the claw on the index finger is the biggest bone in the arm. Wow. And then tip that tail with just a tiny bone that looks like a claw. What? And it's, it, Exactly. This is a it's bizarre. insane. It doesn't make any sense, but that is by far just the weirdest combination of things. And it happens to be something I study oh, because it's so weird. That's good. I'm glad that we could, yeah. we could get your study area in there. All right, a question from YouTube. Is it true that dinosaur predators only see prey if it's moving? Well, it's not true with birds. So, you know, and obviously we can't observe what dinosaurs are doing. But that is kind of a fiction that was invented for the convenience of the story in Jurassic Park. And if you read the novel version of The Lost World, they demonstrate that Dr. Grant was actually wrong about that, <laughs> at least in the book version of the story. So luckily he did die in the first movie, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. A fan from PBS Digital Studios Facebook, apart from birds, are there other animals that we, have, that we know come from dinosaurs? Not other than the, you know, the many lineages of dinosaurs that existed during the Mesozoic era. Birds are just sort of the one group that passed through the, the extinction and thrived in the, in the wake of it. But nothing else alive today or alive during any point in the age of mammals is descended from the dinosaurs. Very cool. It's a little disappointing. I know, right? Yeah. Just one, just yeah. birds. I guess that's okay. Uh, Bruce from National Museum of Natural History Facebook. Does the fossil record give us any clues to the social lives of T. rex or triceratops? It's an interesting question. And right now the fossil record of both of those animals is quite distinct in that of both of them are actually mostly found in isolation. There aren't any, actually any bone beds of like huge herds of triceratops, mm -hmm. mostly just singleton skeletons discovered out in the American West. Despite the popular depiction of triceratops as a, you know, a social animal that mm -hmm. lives in large groups. However, there are studies of pathologies on the body, that is actual bone injuries that can be seen in the fossil record. Wow. And those in triceratops are positioned in such a way, you know, quite regularly, that suggests that these animals might have interlocked their horns right. and done, you know, kind of competitive contests for territory or just being, cool. you know, just being bored. Right that, you know, kind of resemble what we see in modern horned mammals. Okay, well, thanks again for those questions. Again, keep them coming.
but we're going to keep moving on. So I want to talk more about mammals and how, they, <laughs> and how they've evolved from these relatively small creatures to some truly colossal individuals later in the Cenozoic. Absolutely. Why don't we go take a look at a giant ground sloth, our Eremotherium lorillardii. That's a great name. It, it, it's, it rolls off the tongue. It's it really, does. It's really it does. Nice. It kind of rolls yeah. off the tongue. Now, yeah, mammals after the time of diatrima in particular just really become, come into their own. They, for, there's a huge variety of them, large mammals, small mammals. And I think one of the things that makes the distinction between like, the age of mammals in the past and what we have today are things like the animal we're going to look at. Modern sloths are you know, relatively small <laughs> animals that live in Central and South America between 10, 20 pounds, entirely dedicated to a life in the trees with their long curved claws, right. herbivores. And there's only two major lineages that are still alive today living in those jungles. And I think what's amazing about that is how radically it contrasts with an animal you know, kind of like like this one, this giant ground sloth. Oh my gosh, this thing is huge. It's like as big as an elephant. Yeah. Oh my gosh, no. how, how big are we talking here? So the estimates on this Arimatherium are around three tons, so 6,000 pounds, wow. you know, 20 feet or so in length. And what's crazy is that's not the biggest that these ground sloths get. What? There are some Megatherium, which is an even larger genus from South America that reached Four tons? It's nuts. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's crazy. Nuts. So why would an animal like Eremotherium grow to be so large? It's a really, that's one of those really complicated questions that probably has many different, different answers. And it's still a very active area of study for scientists who are interested in you know, gigantism. Why right. do things get so big? Mm -hmm. With herbivorous mammals, there are a lot of hypotheses about what pushes that to happen. One idea, is that it expands the area for the gut. Oh. Being you know, specialist herbivores, it helps to have a larger gut to allow more fermentation to happen, to derive more nutrient from your plant diet. It also is probably really advantageous for dealing with, uh, with predators. Much easier to you know, ward off prey, if, or predators, if you're an enormous size. So do you think that Eremotherium or any giant ground sloth really would have much Predators? I don't think so. Some of the most you know, vicious or appear seemingly vicious <laughs> critters in the mammalian kind of predator world lived alongside Arimatherium, animals like Smilodon, saber-toothed right. cats. But those, although gigantic, did not reach a size that really would have threatened a monster sloth yes. quite like this. Oh my gosh. So would like little baby sloths? Oh yeah, I wouldn't want to be a baby sloth living, you know, living with the, all these mammalian predators around. But once once I got to this size, it might be a good way of making a living. Okay, okay, okay. So so how did we go from this to a small mammal that spends most of its time in the trees? I don't know. <laughs> that's one of the that's a really interesting question and it, you know, brings up one of the most amazing things about the modern sloths. I mentioned there were two lineages that yeah. are living in the Central and South American jungles. And they both you know, do that suspending from the trees, you know, hanging hang in there, very, very sort of lazy lifestyle. What's amazing about them, based on our understanding of their evolutionary history, they didn't have a common ancestor that did that. They descended from separate sort of ground sloth type ancestors to both achieve this, this common lifestyle. And right now, scientists are still trying to understand the evolutionary history of sloths to, to figure out how that transition happened. There's no great transitional fossil that shows, you know, a ground sloth, you know, with, with arboreal adaptations, tree-dwelling right. adaptations uh -huh. that would, you know, explain how we get what we have today. And where is the research on sloth evolution today? One of the, it's, it's awesome we're talking about this because there was actually a series of papers that came out last week wow. that delved into that very question. And what these scientists, these teams of scientists were able to do is using fossil bones, they were able to pull out samples of protein and ancient DNA sequences mm -hmm. and use those to help reconstruct an evolutionary tree of multiple different ancient sloth species. And that actually kind of really shakes up what we understand about sloth evolution. It was long believed that one of the living sloths, the two-toed sloth, 
was closely related to an animal that actually lived here in the eastern United States some 11,000 years ago, an animal called Megalonyx. Oh. And that evolutionary tree is now kind of uprooted. Oh, so we, uh, we still have a lot to learn about how, uh, how ancient sloths, about these sloths. Yeah, yeah. relate to the modern ones. That's really cool. So I hear the collection has some giant ground sloth dung. Yeah, no, well, there's, there's quite a bit of that. What, yeah. do we, what do we learn from that? Well, you know, what comes out the back end of a sloth? <laughs> um, it's primarily, it's great that these things are herbivores in a way because plants contain a lot of non-digestible material, right. which means that comes out the back end. And with these dung samples, we're able to look at what, what these sloths consumed in their life. And at least in some samples from Western North America that we have, we see a wide variety of different flowering plants, grasses, seeds. Sloths, at least out, these sloths that produce these dung samples, mm -hmm didn't seem to have a particular preference for one kind of plant or another. They basically just, you know, shoveled whatever they could into their mouths. And uh, how, uh, how big are we talking here on uh, this I dung? I mean, you got some samples that are maybe, you know, fist size, and then some are a little closer to soccer ball. Oh my gosh. Soccer ball on scale, it's, it's big poo. <laughs> well, that's a big poo. All right, a well, bit. on that note, I want to know what you're wondering about at home. So we're going to take some more audience questions. All right. Sounds good. Here we go. Bring it on. Let's see. Gregory at Eon's Facebook, how were animals this large able to consume enough calories to stay alive? That is an eternal question. And it even gets crazier when you think of herbivorous animals that are bigger than a ground sloth, right. like the sauropod dinosaurs, you know, right. which, you know, this thing is three tons. Those animals could potentially reach above 50 tons with a tiny, tiny head. You know, the ground sloth's head is not particularly gigantic either. So modern herbivorous animals that are at large sizes need to consume enormous amounts of food, like at a relatively regular rate. Right. And with a lot of these extinct things, it's not exactly clear right. how exactly their lifestyles would have worked to accommodate these incredible energetic needs. They must have been on the move all the time. Let's see, a question from Natural Museum of Natural History Facebook. How much would a T-Rex have to eat in a single day? That is a really complicated question to which I don't have an answer. It re depends on how much energy a T-Rex needed in oh, a yeah. specific day. And that requires a lot of information about its metabolism. Mm -hmm. Now, a modern reptile has a relatively slow metabolism. You can feed, you know, well, some modern reptiles, slow metabolism. With a snake, you can feed it you know, a rodent at relatively infrequent intervals, mm -hmm. and it'll be all right. right. It'll just be inert for a long time. If you try the same thing with a cat, it would be extremely cranky very, very quickly because very. a cat has a much higher metabolic rate. Right. Now, T-Rex, we don't know exactly mm -hmm. how high the metabolic rate would have been there. So we can't say you know, exactly what its, what its needs would be, but there are some scientific estimates that it would have needed to consume dozens of pounds of meat at least in order to maintain itself. <laughs> a cow a day mm -hmm. keeps the T-Rex happy. Let's see, uh, Michael <laughs> from Smithsonian Channel Facebook. What dinosaur actually survived the KT extinction event to evolve into modern birds? Any ideas? Well, that's an interesting question. So birds were already, there were already lots of species of birds living mm -hmm. alongside the dinosaurs. Some of right. them were really weird toothy birds with you know, strange beaks and you know, massive skulls, odd looking things. Yes. And all of those, but all of those also died out at right. the end of the Cretaceous period. However, the current evidence suggests that at least a few species, a few of the major lineages of modern birds, like the one that leads to chickens and ducks, the ones that lead to the ostriches, emus, and rheas, and then the one that leads to everything else, were probably already established oh. at the end of the Cretaceous right. period. We only really have a good example of an animal called Vegavis, which is on, which is probably closest to the chicken duck lineage, might be right. closer to the, the ducks, honestly, from the Cretaceous period of all places of Antarctica. And, but unfortunately, that's the only member of sort of the modern bird family that we know definitively from the Cretaceous period. Wow. It's a lot of discoveries to be made to figure out how many of those there were right. before the extinction. Right. 
Okay, next question. Kiro on YouTube, are dinosaurs warm-blooded or are they cold-blooded? If they are either, what are the indications of that? That is a tough question with a disappointingly wishy-washy answer because <laughs> dinosaurs were incredibly varied. Right. I mean, if we look at modern birds, yeah. these are you know, classically warm-blooded animals, mm -hmm. high metabolisms, right. very, very, very fast growth rates and a lot of kind of metabolic requirements. They need to eat mm -hmm. a lot more than an equivalent-sized reptile. And the dinosaurs closest to birds, the theropod lineage, seems to include in it a lot of animals that, again, based on the same methods that we use to understand the age of T-Rex, that sectioning of bones, we can also understand things like um, the past, how many blood vessels were invested within oh, yeah. those bones. Mm -hmm. So, And that gives us a reflection of just how much was pumping through this animal, how much, you know, how much active growth was going on. And based on that, a lot of dinosaurs were you know, growing quite fast, probably had quite high metabolisms, maybe not as high as modern birds mm -hmm. and modern mm -hmm. mammals, but it was a huge range that oh, we yeah. see in the dinosaurs. So it's a, it's a question with like, they grew faster, they were probably more energetically active than modern reptiles, but there would have been a huge variety from things like Velociraptor to a Stegosaurus right. or something right. like that. Right. Okay, next question. Aaron from Smithsonian Facebook, what kind of climate did these sloths like best? And do we think that they were covered in insects like sloths are today sometimes? That's an interesting question. Yeah, that's a good one. So what's the thing that's cool about ground sloths is despite the fact that they're like today, we're still trying to understand, okay, how did any of these things make a living? Right. During the last, part, the last half of the Cenozoic, being a ground sloth was a great way to make a living because these things were present all over South America, jungle environments, in grassland environments. They made it up into Central America, and then they populated North America as well. They were off in Florida. Most of our dung samples come from Western North America, which is relatively dry. Sloths did fine there. Yeah. We even find them in mountainous areas in what's now Colorado. So. Lots of ground sloths did, you know, didn't really mind a wide range of, of different environments. Remotherium is a, kind of a notable ground sloth in that it lived in both northern south, central, and southern North America. So oh, wow. it may have been one of the more environmentally variable of these animals living, you know, Very around cool. there. All right. Brett from PBS Digital Studios Facebook. What type of mating habits did the sloth engage in? Could that have led to a shift into common species? That's a very interesting question. Right now, I don't think we could say for certain how ground sloths would have, uh, would have dealt with that particular uh, life event. And I don't know. I, yeah. I, can't, I can't necessarily see how that would link to the transition to the trees, but maybe it's a possibility. Who knows? Worth researching. All right. Again, thanks for your questions, and this is my last call. So if you would like to participate in this Q&A, submit your questions for Adam now in the comments. We're going to do some more Q&A here in just a second. Okay. So this is my last question for you. All right. And it's probably the most important question of the evening. I'm stressed. It's good. It's good. Bring it on. What is your favorite dinosaur in the exhibit? Oh, my answer's going to be, oh, it's lame. No. Because I'm still a sucker for Tyrannosaurus rex. I a love lot of the Tyrannosaurus rex. love specimen. Tyrannosaurus. It's such an amazing animal. Yes. So mine would be the Triceratops, which um, yours is having yeah. a much better night. Great. Now I feel much better about my decision <laughs> because mine is, you know, is consuming yours. It's good. <laughs> right. It's good. All right. Well, let's chat more with our fans and open it up to some more questions. So. Cool beans. My awesome question getter. Question okay. bone. KC at Eon's Facebook, why did reptiles branch off into different families like birds and mammals? Oh man, <laughs> that is that is a question of why, you know, kind of why ev any particular event right? in evolutionary history happens. You know, the split between these great lineages has to begin within a single population of mm -hmm. similar looking animals, and that you know, necessarily it's a relatively, you know, slow transition. Right. So early on, there might be just very small environmental barriers or just, you know, 
pressures in small parts of the population that cause them to diverge into slightly different species. Mm -hmm. And it's only later that these major changes happen. But all of this is likely the product of many environmental factors, mm -hmm. kind of what we call selective pressures right. that push, mm -hmm. kind of environmental things that push lineages in certain directions within their sort of evolutionary history. And there's also chance sometimes. <laughs> You know, especially with the, the vastness of some of the disasters that have happened in right. Earth's history, it's almost the luck of the draw geographically and anatomically. Who, who survives to, you know, to live on, to evolve another day, and who you know, falls down? All right. Okay, here we go. Elizabeth and Michael Cazares at YouTube would like to know, do you think there are some dinosaurs that are still alive? Well, I'm, I'll, I'll use the cop-out answer first. <laughs> there are 10,000 species of living dinosaurs. And we call them birds. Right. But if the, uh, the questioners are referring to things like Mokili Mbembe, this like, mythical sauropod that's oh, supposed yes, to live in the, yes. the modern Congo or other, other, you know, other classic dinosaurs or other Mesozoic reptiles, probably not. Yeah. Like, dinosaurs are... Pro would have been prominent parts of whatever ecosystem they lived in. Mm -hmm. So to have them living today, you would need to have a functioning population of these animals you know, thriving in some environment somewhere. Right. Right. And we know a lot about the world's environments. I mean, we're still discovering tons of things, but it seems unlikely that on land anywhere, there would be a place for dinosaurs to still be discovered. Prove me wrong, please. <laughs> I would love it to be wrong. But for now, there don't seem to be any other dinosaurs. All right. A uh, user from YouTube would like to know, what were the oxygen levels in the Triassic era? Ooh, interesting. They were quite, quite variable, actually. Hmm. There was a lot of fluctuation in oxygen levels during especially the first part of the Triassic period, which is after the world's greatest mass extinction right. which ended the preceding Permian period 252 million years ago. At that point we lose 90 percent of 90 plus percent of species known in the fossil record which is insane. A it's a day. huge <laughs> number and after that we actually see in all kinds of isotopes and oxygen and carbon huge fluctuations in their kind of concentrations of the various isotopes in the mm -hmm. environment and that seems to connect to just a lot of environmental instability, like regular booms and busts in the ecosystems of the early part of the Triassic. It stabilizes a bit later on, but it's, it's, a, crazy. it's a chaotic time. It's a roller coaster of oxygen. All right, Abraham at Eon's Facebook page, is there any ideas as to what Parasolophus might have used its crest for? Absolutely. <laughs> Parasolophus is one of my a favorite dinosaurs, you know, a hadrosaur with this giant tube crest sticking yeah. out the back of its head. And fortunately, we've got some great specimens of this dinosaur mm -hmm. from Western North America that preserve the, the head in three dimensions, which allows us to understand the, the, the structure of what's inside that tube. Right, right. And the classic idea is that that, that crest mm -hmm. is connected to the nasal passages. So there's a Ooh. huge convoluted passage within that structure. Mm -hmm. And some paleontologists have created like basically musical instruments that are <laughs> that mirror the structure of that horn and like you know creates this deep booming resonant sound. Yeah. So that's one possibility right. of what Parasaurolophus would have done with it. Another is that it's just like the nasal passages has got dragged along as this crest became more prominent as a display structure, either yeah. indicating the presence of you know one Parasaurolophus to another or you know acting as some kind of like like mating display. Right, right, right. But it's one of those things that, you know, we need to learn more in order to get a better answer. For sure. Okay. Taylor from Smithsonian Facebook. I understand whales today keep getting bigger because they're more efficient the bigger they get. Why aren't modern land-dwelling animals even bigger than dinosaurs? The pressures that cause a whale to grow to a certain size relate to you know their ability to you know best 
adapt to their environment. Mm -hmm. In the case of the baleen whales, they follow these sort of incredible booms in productivity in the oceans right. that produce huge quantities of zooplankton. You know, krill is the classic one that a lot of baleen whales seem to just, you know, they're, they're gourmets of that. Yes, yes. And you know, that, that is the pressure that allows them to reach these exceptional sizes. In the land ecosystems, it's an entirely different set of rules that's right. requiring them to, you know, to kind of achieve whatever size they do. And one of the biggest problems is we're not buoyant here. <laughs> There's, you know, we have to actually like stand physically. Yeah, and that, deal with gravity. That isn't hard. There's a reason the sloth is as beefy as it is, is because standing up like this is not easy. Yeah. A whale doesn't necessarily have to deal with those same kind of constraints right. on its body size. Very cool. All right, this is the last question. Oh my goodness. Oh, that okay. Good. That was good. <laughs> a fan from YouTube. How do I become a paleontologist like you both? All right, uh, everyone sit down. This is going to be about like four <laughs> hours. Becoming a paleontologist is an interesting thing because it can happen in many, many different ways. Right. I followed sort of the classical academic path. Mm -hmm. I went to my university and got a bachelor's in biology mm -hmm. and moved on to a PhD program, which was on the anatomy of vertebrates. Mm -hmm. And here I am as a researcher this is at the Smithsonian in the, in the right. wake of that. But some people don't follow that same academic path. Some right. people study geology right. instead. Mm -hmm. Others concentrate on the technical aspects of mm -hmm. paleontology, like the, the role of the people that put these skeletons back together and clean up the bones oh, from yeah. the field, the preparators, mm -hmm. cannot, be, cannot be overstated. It's right. incredibly important and another way to become an important part of the paleo community. Being a science communicator yeah. is also a major thing, and fortunately it's becoming a much more prominent thing in the, the field today, right? Yeah. So, there are lots of different paths to follow to be a paleontologist. So you have to kind of decide for yourself yeah. what it is about it that drives your passions. Do you right. want to discover new things out in the field? Do you want to be a part of the museum community? Or do you want to share the knowledge of what you learn to a broader audience? Like there are so many different ways to follow that passion. And if you find what you like, get in touch with your local museum and, you know, Find the people that'll chat with you there. Yeah, yeah. They'll have great advice. Of course. Okay, you guys, that's all the time that we have for tonight. Thank you so much, Adam, for having us. Oh, it's been fun. I'm glad, I'm glad you guys came. I know, right? And thanks you for everybody watching on YouTube and Facebook, and thanks for all of your questions. This was wonderful. And be sure to check out When Whales Walked, a journey in deep Journey in Deep Time. Well, it premieres on PBS and the Smithsonian Channel on June 19th at 9 p.m. Eastern. And if you want to know more about PBS Eons, find us on YouTube at youtube.com eons. Bye!